what I'd like to say is this is my good friend Summer Shields. We have uh, been in the battle for a while. Summer and I started off as the first slate of LaRouche candidates. We originally started with three of us uh, running in the 2010 election. And as I ran here, taking on the NASA, uh, calling for the full funding of NASA and impeaching Obama, we had Summer doing the same thing in California, in San Francisco, against Nancy Pelosi. And he gave Nancy Pelosi a <laughs> Massachusetts and Boston running against Barney Frank, bail out Barney Frank. She swept the floor with Barney Frank there too. And so now Summer and myself and Rachel have been joined by uh, three additional candidates, one of which you met today. And I'm just happy to have Summer here because I think it's important for people to get a sense of what our national slate represents, what we're doing to lead the nation and provide the leadership as the real institution of the presidency. So Summer's going to speak to you today, and then after Summer, we'll have Joel Dijon, who's going to be speaking. So um, let's have some fun. All right. Yeah. I'll start by saying, even though Keisha just introduced me, that Keisha Rogers should be the congresswoman in the 22nd congressional district. Yeah. Should be, but actually can be. So I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I have anything to say about it, she will. So uh, I guess this phase of the of the discussion here, and I'm very honored to be here today, because it's not Texas is not San Francisco. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> you probably guessed. But it's uh, well, we're all one nation, and so that's a unique kind of thing that you're dealing with. You're dealing with a uh, non-Jeffersonian approach to the uh, United States. We're not a splinter nation, even though there's some people who try to splinter us up and have some sort of opposition between certain sections. For little small reasons, they have that. Um, I'll start by, by addressing the fact that I'm not, my name is Summer Shields. I'm not Sky Shields. <laughs> he's my brother. And actually, the humorous thing about this is that I love my brother. He's a, he's a super intelligent, wonderful guy. And uh, what often happens is that I would always end up having people go, Oh, so you're Sky's brother. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you could say that. So I was excited. Because yeah. <laughs> I was finally going to run for Congress, and I was like, All right, I'm running for Congress. Sky's going to be my brother. <laughs> what ended up happening is uh, I go out and I meet people all the time. And I'll meet people, and then I'll say, I'll call you back later, as we often do as organizers and fighting for truth and justice. And then let me know what you think about what I'm up to. And then I call them back up, and they're like, oh, hey, you know, I was doing research on you. Is your brother Sky? <laughs> <laughs> so they meet me, and it still never ends up. Uh, as your brother Sky Shields, which is a good thing because I would love to be associated with Sky Shields. Yeah, very yeah. powerful guy. I'll start by just saying that uh, from what we've seen, I think what Mr. LaRouche said, what Keisha said earlier, what Jason was bringing up, that we have more than enough evidence <coughs> to know that uh, the universe is made for mankind and that mankind is made for the universe. I think that, ooh, thank you so much. <coughs> I think uh, just what we've been discussing in the recent period, the universe is made for man and mankind is made for the universe. There's all these interesting things that come up about why we as a human species on Earth are in a very opportune location in the solar system. It's, kind of, it's almost too good to be true. Uh, the fact that we have conditions, when we started going to the Arctic region, we have conditions in the Arctic that are going to mirror the exact same kind of conditions we're going to run into on, on the moon when we begin to develop the moon base. Same temperatures you're doing with, definitely in the lava tunnels up in the moon. 
and you're dealing with perhaps certain other similarities. We've got a, a great abundance of helium-3 on the moon, which is a perfect fuel for fusion, nuclear fusion power source. And it's just kind of sitting there right next to us, and it's getting replenished by movement from the sun and solar wind and things like this. We have a mass of a radiation belt called the, the Van Allen Radiation Belt, which is what we were talking about today, and uh, Jason mentioned, which is a great source of the fuel we're going to need for matter-antimatter reactions, which is really an incredible move for mankind because it's going to be a form of energy that is largely creates the energy that you require from the mass itself that you use with matter-antimatter. You're basically talking about a, a near direct conversion, if not a total direct conversion, of matter into energy, which is something we've never, we've never uh, accomplished in mass. And when you get to that phase, almost forget Mars and just go to Mars. You're talking about interstellar space travel, where mankind begins to uh, travel through space, travel through the solar system in a way that we've never accomplished before. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to wish everyone uh, also, since I'm coming from San Francisco, a uh, long in quieta, which is the Chinese phrase for happy year of the dragon. And we just got in celebrating the Chinese New Year, which just recently passed. Uh, San Francisco is about 30% Chinese, for people who don't know that. And it's the interesting thing about it is you have a direct relationship between San Francisco and mainland China. So whenever I would do something in Chinatown, San Francisco, it would immediately be covered in the major Chinese press, the China Daily, and that would end up right back in mainland China. So you talk about having a, an effect to stop World War III, whenever Lyndon LaRouche makes a statement, he already gets, they know him by name in China. And so whenever one of our candidates is involved in doing something, and it gets picked up by one of these Chinese newspapers, Immediately, you have a, a, a direct move to prevent thermonuclear World War III coming from our slate and our candidacy and our move. So you have Mr. LaRouche who's laid the groundwork for us, and you have us who are treading along in those barrel footsteps <coughs> to try and push for a policy uh, that will prevent a thermonuclear World War III. Briefly, I want to take a, a brief arc on history. Because I think when we say, we always say the credit system, LaRouche said today that we only have real, really two policies we're dealing with. We've got Glass-Steagall and we've got the credit system and the fight around that. As many people in this room probably already know, the credit system itself was created at the founding of the United States by the creation of the National Bank. And we had a national banking policy for about half a century in the United States before the charter for the third national bank was refused by Andrew Jackson. And Alexander Hamilton, who proposed the first national bank, was killed for that. He put forward a policy to, for a specific funds specifically for internal development of the United States. And he was killed for that, for precisely that reason. Um, James Madison, when he was president, who opposed the national bank, initially, when Alexander Hamilton was around, saw the remarkable developments that the National Bank had created. And so when the National Bank came up to be rechartered, he supported the rechartering of the National Bank. And it gives you a sense that it works. <laughs> the first National Bank, Bank worked so well that when it was brought back up to be rechartered, someone who opposed it initially supported it, which was President James Madison. John Quincy Adams, who I'll weave this in as a part of this, who really became uh, one of the first major U.S. political figures to have diplomatic relations with Russia. He used the, national, the uh, second national bank for the express purpose of building the first rail we ever saw inside the United States. So we, the first basis of infrastructure in the United States was developed, and he's also from Massachusetts, John Quincy Adams. The first, and he wasn't just thinking about Massachusetts. <laughs> we had a couple of Massachusetts and Massachusetts. In here. But, <laughs> Commonwealth. Okay. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But we are, what he did was he built the first rail development in the country using the first national, using the second national bank. And he 
created the beginnings of our canal system, expanding our canal systems also. Uh, moving forward, um, well, that's, well, actually, sorry, he actually created the first observatory <coughs> in the United States, in Ohio. And when he died, Abraham Lincoln was a pallbearer at his funeral. And so there's a, you know, they, you, probably, you want to stay away from just simple connect the dots relationships. But what you do get a sense of when you look at this brief arc here is a real historical arc of U.S. development, which started with a express intention by the U.S. Constitution, which was expressed by the National Bank, to have a capability for a sovereign nation to decide its own destiny. And this carried all the way up into Lincoln. And I think when you look at it from that standpoint, you realize what Lincoln was really fighting for. He wasn't just fighting to free the slaves. That ended up being a part of what he did. But he did it for the Union. And he knew that the national banking policy of the Union was necessary. And that's what the essence of his greenback policy was. He was hated. If you read what the London newspapers were saying about Abraham Lincoln, when Abraham Lincoln started his greenback policy, you will want another greenback policy all over again. Because London hated what Lincoln was doing, and they said it all the time. They said things like, this is, this is uh, the worst form of tyranny. It's a nation that's deciding its own destiny. How can this be? And then you get a sense of how the British Empire thinks of evil. Because the British Empire's idea of, of something that is a detriment to them is exactly what Keisha and I and the other members of the slate are fighting for, is a principled sense of what the United States ought to be as a sovereign nation that's deciding its own destiny. London hated it from the beginning. And these are the same people who, who did kill Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and Lincoln, for that matter. So, <clears throat> you had an intervening period. Um, if I'm correct, the first president who was assassinated, there's been so many actually, when you start to weave the picture and paint it, was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, since you, had a, you had a couple of assassinations in between. Um, yeah, Lincoln was assassinated. Garfield was assassinated. Kinley. Zachary Taylor. Kinley. Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor, Zachary Taylor assassinated. William Henry Harrison. Who knows? Yeah, he died really early in his administration. And then you had really kind of a series of upstarts of patriotism in the United States and drops of patriotism because of these, these ongoing assassinations, political turmoil. The U.S. has a, a relatively extremely violent political history. You have these other countries that have these, ex these extremely violent political histories. The difference is that these other countries that have these violent political histories, they end up collapsing, and they have a whole new form of government that are created. In the U.S., you have these, these extremely violent political history. I mean, whether you're talking about presidents who were assassinated, whether or not you're talking about uh, the collapse of Reconstruction and the drive, the uh, racism in the South, things like this, you have an extremely uh, violent political history in the United States. But our constitutional government never ceased to be. And so <clears throat> along comes Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I'm just going to jump forward here. And he's one of my favorites because what he represented was why minorities, labor, and anything else that's good in the Democratic Party is a Democrat. And I'm leaving out some people because there were some good Democrats from California who were anti-slavery, who fought to make California a functional non-slave state. But overall, the Democratic Party was a piece of junk. And you had really bad people. Andrew Jackson came out of the Democratic Party. You had some other people who were just really bad individuals who came out of the Democratic Party. And it wasn't until you got uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who took, totally took the Democratic Party and turned it into something worthwhile. And he was a friend of humanity. Uh, I always get a kick. People say that Russia is our enemy. Or they say that we have some sort of natural beef with Russia. We've never, I even had people tell me we've never, we've actually never ever been allies with Russia. They've always been an enemy. He was just a Cold War baby. It's someone who just grew up in the Cold War and didn't know anything other than Russia's bad because of communism and all this other stuff. In actuality, most of our history as a nation, we were very good friends with Russia. And you saw this under John Quincy Adams, you saw this before John Quincy Adams. You saw John Adams was in Europe and John Quincy Adams was fluent in Russia. You saw it under Lincoln. Lincoln worked with uh, 
Tsar Alexander II on when he would, when when Lincoln was freeing the slaves, Tsar Alexander II was freeing the serfs. They had a close collaboration. Both of them were assassinated. And so you have this ongoing relationship of cooperation between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, you had Franklin Roosevelt, who had some a couple of the most unlikely of friends as a, as a part of this process of uh, reinstating one the credit system in the United States. But what he did in cooperation with uh, both Stalin in Russia and then also his cooperation with Chiang Kai-shek in uh, China, who was the head at the time of China. Uh, just a quick thing on China. China itself has a similar history of love of the United States. You had a great respect and reverence towards the United States coming from Russia. Same thing with China. Sun Yat-sen, who overthrew the imperial government of China, was a total American Republican patriot. And by Republican, I don't mean big R and little R. He was pro-Republic. And he overthrew the government of China. A serious, long battle, long fight. And he began to implement a republic in, the, in uh, China. And he based his whole revolution on Abraham Lincoln. He based everything that he did on Abraham Lincoln. And his principle, which is the uh, same idea in Chinese, but you get a, a good sense of it when you start to translate it into Chinese, or from, from Chinese into English. But the principle of the people, uh, nationalism, by the people, democracy, and for the people, the general welfare, these are all principles that are inside the U.S. Constitution, and he based his whole revolution to put in place a functional government in China on those very same principles. So these are ideas that the United States not only was a friend of these countries, but if it hadn't been for the United States in principle as an idea, you never could have spread the ideas of republicanism and science throughout the face of the planet. <coughs> so, Franklin Roosevelt continued that tradition of our friendship with Russia. Very good friends. Um, what he did was, if it weren't for Franklin Roosevelt, many of us wouldn't be in this room, and we'd all be speaking very good German. <laughs> that would probably be maybe one of the better. Actually, maybe not even good German, because Hitler, you know, they say he had spoke really bad German. Yeah. <laughs> he really wasn't a hit. <laughs> and so he's really dumb, too. And there's a whole history. There's a, there's a history that goes into this, which is a political history. And there's a scientific history, which is just as political. Because during the same time, you had fights going on uh, with certain of key debates in scientific history. And you had key people who were extremely political because of circumstances, who were European scientists. One of them is Albert Einstein. He was forced to flee Germany. Several of the, of the best scientists, best thinkers in Germany were actually removed during the time of Hitler. And so, uh, um, at a certain point, I'm trying to remember the name, um, it wasn't Planck, but it was another figure in, in, in uh, German science whose name I can't recall. But he was asked, was it really, he was asked by the, the uh, German Nazi party when they were asking him, you know, did you, was German science destroyed? When uh, you, when you, when we kicked out the Jewish scientists, because many of them were Jewish, some of the greatest minds, they were, they were all Jewish, Jewish Germans, and he said, "No, you guys didn't, you, you guys didn't destroy science in Germany. We just don't have it anymore." <laughs> so, what you saw was a a clear destruction intellectually in Germany at the same time as you saw a political destruction in Germany. If it hadn't been for the efforts of Franklin Roosevelt and what he did with the Lend-Lease Act and the fight to develop and give an industrial base for the Soviet Union to begin fighting back the Germans back, going back to 1939, if that had never happened, if, if Stalin's army hadn't been able to keep back the Germans who were pounding into Russia, <coughs> we easily would have lost World War II. And it came so close. If Roosevelt hadn't done what he did, and this also increased our manufacturing capability back to 1939. People say that the war saved us. Well, maybe the, the war having started allowed us to produce more. But had it not been for Roosevelt's fight in the Congress against people who didn't want to have a Lynn Lisa Act, maybe he had to fight for it. It wasn't like it was something that just happened. Okay, we just started building stuff because the war began somehow. 
if he hadn't been fighting for the Lend Lease Act inside the U.S. Congress, we never would have been building the material goods that saved Russia in their time of crisis. And you're talking about massive goods being shipped. I mean, much of them ended up on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Good men who fought in World War II, and a lot of rolls of steel and tons of other things ended up on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean because they're going across the northern Atlantic and you have the German U-boat, we didn't know how to handle them at the time, and our, without us even having gone to war. <clears throat> I always get a kick out of people who say Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt was a warmonger. Well, if you know how many ships were sunk before we even declared war in Germany, you'd be amazed. Because when you talk about how easily we talk about going to war with these countries today, Iran, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, people go, oh, you know, they make excuses. They don't even agree with Obama. They don't agree with Bush, they just make excuses for why they, so they don't have to do anything. And we go to war at the drop of a hat, and yet when, when Roosevelt was president, we had whole ships full of goods that were made by American labor that ended up on the bottom of the Atlantic. <coughs> so if it hadn't been for that, we never, ever, ever would have won World War II. Uh, to give you a sense of this, <coughs> Roosevelt died, uh, he had a whole post-war plan for the United Nations. And San Francisco is where the United Nations Conference was, the first United Nations Conference, the founding conference of the United Nations was in San Francisco. You had several preceding conferences leading up to that. Uh, there's still a big memorial in, <coughs> in San Francisco, a very, very nice memorial for the United Nations, which has the preamble written on the ground of what the United Nations was intended to be. And you have uh, the different listed countries and the years that they entered on these pillars that are sitting out. Uh, you can read it all. And I've lived, in, I've lived in Oakland for a long time, which is right across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco. And I always went to San Francisco, and I never realized that this was a United Nations memorial for all these years because there's a lot of homeless people you know, around this thing. You need to be walking around and be a place you didn't want to look. And I actually found it on Africa. I didn't even know the United Nations was founded in San Francisco because we're talking about uh, many generations later. And I was looking on the ground, well not too many, but we'll get into that. Looking on the ground and I saw the, uh, the uh, United Nations symbol sitting on the ground. And then I looked up and I saw all the pillars and all the different countries that entered the United Nations and what year they entered. <coughs> So he had a whole post-war plan. He died less than two weeks before, Franklin Roosevelt that is, died less than two years before the founding of the United Nations. So <clears throat> had he lived, Truman wouldn't have been the uh, factor in deciding what the United Nations became. Uh, diplomacy with Russia, well, let me give you this sense first. When the day Franklin Roosevelt died, Pravda newspaper, which is the state, it used to be the state-run newspaper of, of the Soviet Union, now it's just a newspaper, it still exists. Uh, they had big, bold print. Franklin Roosevelt, friend of the Soviet Union, is dead. With a picture of Roosevelt. And it was all over, distributed all over uh, Russia. Um, in the Moscow embassy, you had a crowd of, of hundreds of thousands of people who surrounded the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And anybody who came out of the embassy was grabbed and thrown into the air and treated as a, as a hero. And they praised the Americans. They loved what the United States had done because they knew that Roosevelt was the individual who saved them from, from destruction. And they knew that the U.S. as a principle is what saved them. And Stalin, the funny thing, if you look at the, the discussion between Stalin and Roosevelt back and forth, Stalin was always amazed by how incredible our industrial capacity was in the United States, even though we had what he perceived as a capitalist system. <laughs> so he's like, how do they do this with capitalism? Because he's really confused. This, you know, the American system wasn't known to him. So he said, okay, you've got free trade in Britain, you've kind of got the US lumped in there together with Britain, and you've got communism. So he's shocked, because we were producing more than he could possibly imagine to fund, to give them their war effort while they were producing hardly anything. And that was the US. It's really, it's quite remarkable. So Roosevelt was seen as a, as a hero. He was seen as a victor. He was loved by the Russian people. Within a week of, of uh, Roosevelt's death, Truman was uh, already yelling <laughs> at Molotov, who was, the, who was supposed to be the representative of the Soviet Union of the United Nations. And Molotov
Molotov, when he did the spew, they were yelling at each other, and Molotov said, I'm not going to deal with it. Actually, what, what Truman said, he said, here's what I'm going to tell you what to do, and don't talk back to me. Mm -hmm. And it was that kind of blunt talking to an official diplomat from the Soviet Union, someone who, does Russia have differences? Are they a different country? Is it a different culture? Absolutely, of course. But if you're talking about world peace after World War II, don't yell at one of the biggest nations ambassadors to the United Nations at a conference for world peace. <laughs> so, um, yeah, exactly. And so this is when, I mean, essentially, from that day to the present, you just had a grip of U.S. foreign policy, which has been horrible and increasingly horrible. It's the uh, frog boiled and frog being boiled and water slowly kind of syndrome because now that it's in your face and we're just overthrowing governments and we're killing leaders at random and you got young people who are saying maybe I'll get a, a, a future career in the military because there's no jobs, don't want to work at Starbucks, don't want to work at these other places. I'm going to go and join the military and get a job, hopefully. Now that you've got that, people say, oh, this is the way it's been, right? This is the way it is, right? And the remarkable thing about that is it's just two generations. <clears throat> and I always like to think about it in terms of generations, because it's something that Mr. Lewis always talks about. I have a vivid thought about what Franklin Roosevelt, what living under Franklin Roosevelt must have been like. I have an idea that I could picture I had a grandfather serving World War II. He knew Roosevelt. He didn't know Roosevelt the way I know Roosevelt in the same way. But he knew Roosevelt in a way that I'll never know Roosevelt because he served in World War II. <clears throat> um, Lyndon LaRouche's generation, and, and also anybody who's older, but many, especially the, the World War II generation, has a vivid memory of, and LaRouche talks about this, of Lincoln. And so here's the guy, Lincoln. When I think of Lincoln, I think about his way ancient history, almost. Not so totally ancient. Said a little bit, but it's just like people dress differently, you had a different culture back then in the United States. <clears throat> but there's a vivid memory of what it was like in Lyndon LaRouche's mind, in the World War II generation's mind, of what it was like to live under Lincoln. Um, you don't, as Ms. LaRouche has put forward on several occasions, since the baby boomer generation, and there was an explicit attack against uh, the culture, the post-World War II culture, there's been a disconnect from what it meant to these previous generations to exist. It's kind of like an echo each time you, you look at where the drug rock sex counterculture has taken us, where the uh, collapse in the sense of mission of science that we had in the 1960s has taken us. You have a very kind of distant echo of what the United States used to represent. <clears throat> and so, in a sense, can we take that back and return something that many people have never experienced before into something that's going to be a victorious campaign to get mankind to do something? Not just something new, because I think, or not even something old, and this is something that we've taken out. You're not talking about going back to some good old day. You're not saying, let's go back to Kennedy. <laughs> let's go back to Franklin Roosevelt, because you can't really go back to Franklin Roosevelt. You can't go back to Kennedy. It's not because we can't have a great industrial capacity or anything like that. It's because you can't turn the clock back. But what you can do is you can say that there's a real principle in what all these previous people did do, and that that principle can take the form of a very specific development in today's society. And in this, in this, the kind of development we're talking about today is a space, a space, a, a venture in space that we can see now before us. <clears throat> I think um, one of the things that comes up is uh, when you begin to talk about what it is that the U.S. really means and, and what it is, how do you look at human history? Because it's a very interesting thing to try and figure out because we're, we're looking at not so much what is generally laid out on a general idea of what history, what, how history works. LaRouche has pinpointed, I think, extremely clearly. You've had two opposing currents in, in human history. On the one hand, you've had a Republican history, and a Republican side, which was expressed by these individuals I was going through earlier, 
and the other side you had an oligarchical interest. And this principle of an, what he called the oligarchical principle is really not all that easy to understand, as he was bringing up today. It's not something that you can just say, oh, yeah, powerful people. I don't like the Rothschilds. You know, or I don't like people who have a lot of money and look at me funny. That's not really the oligarchical principle. There actually is a, a principle of anti-human that you're dealing with. And one of the biggest problems that he's addressed is two things in the way people tend to try and under, in the comprehension of the oligarchical principle. One is that the oligarchical principle explicitly attacks human creativity. That's the idea of the oligarchy. That's what the drug rock sex counterculture was. When LSD came onto the college campuses, I guarantee you it didn't grow on trees. <laughs> it wasn't just LSD one night from the other. No LSD, LSD. Uh -huh. No marijuana, marijuana. And it became a cultural shift suddenly overnight. Their, their express intention is to destroy human creativity. That's what they want to do. So if their express intention is to destroy human creativity, and you have no idea what human creativity is, as many of our own people don't, then you can't even know how an oligarch, you can't comprehend how an oligarchical principle exists. You just couldn't do it. Um, the other side of this, which I think is closely related to something that Mr. LaRue brought up in a paper just recently, is that people have an actual, aver and this is something that Jason brought up earlier, people have an aversion to uh, their own immortality bringing on their own future development and ongoing. They usually think, here and now, drug, rock, sex, counterculture did this to people. They think, okay, how do I get instant pleasure, instant gratification right now? And that's generally the thought. People say, my job is to do just that. Get instant gratification, get instant pleasure now, get money. And so you can't think outside of it. You can't think of the long-term processing. You can't even think outside of the boundary of your own life. Because the minute you start thinking about that, it actually gets depressing. You say, I don't want to think about me dying because then I won't be here anymore, and I can't get that pleasure anymore. And so you have an inability to understand what this oligarchical principle is by that way, because you're not thinking about the future, which the, as we were just talking about earlier, the oligarchical principle is thinking about the future. The oligarchy is thinking about their children, and their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren. They're thinking about it all wrong, because they don't, they're not promoting space, so they're not going to have much of a chance anyway. But they are thinking about the future of themselves. Uh, many of our own people aren't. It's a, it's a corruption that's embedded in there. But what's been tackled by uh, my brother, Sky Shield, by the team around in the scientific investigation, is not so much the particulars <coughs> of what, how, how these different things, how science is generally tied. You've got these particular things that you're looking at how supposedly how an atom works, you know. These are theories. Supposedly how these other things work. These are all theories. We don't know that as they're coming to conclusions in the basement is that you're trying to find out fundamentally what human creativity is. Because in any investigation that you're engaging in, even if you think it's something that is totally objective, immediately you're investigating the subject of the human mind. You look at anything, you're beginning to look at how the human mind is looking at it, not just how something exists in and of itself. But you're clearly understanding that you're, you are looking at something that is outside of yourself, somewhere out there. You don't fully understand what that thing is, but you know there's something outside of yourself. To abstract human beings from the process is what the environmentalists do. Because they say, OK, well, nature is just wonderful. I just love some nature. Uh, yeah. I just love hiking. Just give me some nature. Uh, but then nature really messed up. They created this thing called humans. <laughs> you know, nature was going along, was doing the right thing. You know, they killed the dinosaur. The dinosaurs got killed. And now we're just moving along. And suddenly nature really messes up and they create human beings. Now that's a total fallacy of science. And it also means that if you're going to abstract human beings from the process, you're not going to know what's really happening in the universe. You just can't. So what the scientific research team has been taking up is what is it that's uniquely human that you have to take into account when you're talking about scientific investigations? And that's not as easy as it first seems because if in fact you're trying to figure out a principle of human creativity and what a human being is, that means it's always subject to be figured out. 
something new about us. So one of the biggest ironies to me about mankind is that you're always trying to figure out something new about ourselves. And into the future, that's what we're going to be doing. So it's a beautiful thing. We'll always know more about who we are. But mankind, Paleolithic man, living in caves and using stone tools versus today, we know a whole heck of a lot more about ourselves today than we knew when Paleolithic man, you know, who knows what they're doing, flooding small rodents with, uh, well, not, yeah, small rodents with, uh, you know, rocks and stuff, eating them. But we know a lot more about ourselves today than we did then in an almost unimaginable difference. Now, as Keisha brought up, between Kennedy, between Abraham Lincoln and Kennedy, just a hundred year distance, we made huge leaps and bounds between what we knew then, and then, and by then I mean 1860, and what we knew by 1960. So you're talking about a world of difference in mankind's conception of mankind's self. And one of the, one of the slides that she showed was the difference in travel of a, of a, of a uh, seafaring trip from the East Coast to the West Coast, around the tip of South America, it used to be a five month journey. When rail was introduced uh, with the cross country, uh, the transcontinental railroad under Abraham Lincoln, it became literally about a three and a half day journey from one side of the coast to the other. So people's conception of time did change. <clears throat> uh, as soon as we start to go into, as we're going to get into here with Joel in a minute, uh, as soon as people started to go into, begin to go into fusion and begin to go into matter antimatter, our conception of what it means to travel is going to be fundamentally different. Now, the difficulty, I think, and it's something we have to think about, is that we think that just the conception itself changed and that that's it. So, therefore, maybe think, it seems like things are faster. But then the question is, is there anything else besides human conception of what time is, anyway? And if you're talking about uh, time, can you just abstract time as its own thing? And if time is its own thing, then where do you find the one thing that represents time in the universe? <clears throat> and then also, uh, can you at all abstract time and space from the movement or action of something that's happening inside the universe? And what we're finding out is not only can you not do that, but you can't leave human beings, you can't leave, you've got on certain, certain uh, by certain uh, estimations, non-living processes, but you can't leave it out of living or human being processes. You cannot say that time is devoid of human conception. And I think the more eerie thing is that the more that mankind starts to figure out and progress in the universe, we're going to find out that time never actually was devoid of human beings in the universe. Perhaps even before human beings even existed here in physical form, at least on Earth. We don't know if there's aliens out there. You know, we, we don't know. We don't know. We, were, we could be aliens. Which <laughs> <laughs> is true. We go out there, they're going to see us as aliens. So, we're, it's, we don't know. We don't know how, we don't really know what we're going to run into when we start to go into the universe. We're very, when you start to think about how little we've done, we're very, we've done very little as a species. Yeah. We know she's an alien. <laughs> She'll be on the first matter antimatter trip <laughs> to the universe. Never to return. <laughs> she can stay there. She'll be asking questions about it as we put her on the show. She'll be like, what is this now? Let's go, Nancy. Let's get on the ship. Let's get new face. But in fact, the idea of mankind is very unique. And it's an interesting thing because a lot of the questions that came up uh, around Einstein, around the question of space and time, and what this really means, and the paradoxes that are expressed in it, were taken up already by poets and, uh, and uh, in literature, in European science. Uh, the great poet of freedom, who people know owe to joy, people who've been around the movement are familiar that the uh, final movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy, it's a beautiful poetic piece, was, it was written by the poet of freedom, Friedrich, Friedrich Schiller. <clears throat> what many people don't know is that Friedrich Schiller had taken up the question of space and time already in his writings on the aesthetical estimations of, 
on the aesthetical ladder involving mankind. In particular, he's explicit about this, that mankind is two. There's two of you sitting in that chair. Anybody sitting down, you standing up. There's two of you that there's both a side of you that is purely sensual, which takes place in time. You've got, you know, your no matter what you try to do, your body is either uh, going towards the hump of your, in, towards the end of your life or over the hump towards the end of your life. So you're always, your body is changing and it's physically changing and time is a measure of that. <clears throat> uh, and then there's also the side of you that he says experiences all times or the infinitude of times, which, is a, which I just ask you to think about. What is he talking about? Was he madman? <laughs> Or is he talking about something very interesting about what it means to be a human being that's not just a sensual being and not just a, uh, a uh, purely, um, as people say, the domain of the spiritual or something like that. But then what does it mean about the human, that side of you that exists in that infinitude of times? He says that you have both of them. You can't really escape both of them. But you can definitely come to understand what human nature is based on these two thing. And so he talks about more than that, but he's addressing the question of space and time already. And these are paradoxes that became utterly confusing when you didn't, you didn't investigate them from the standpoint of mankind, and you just investigated them from the standpoint of a very, of a very cold model of an atom. They actually became extremely confusing to people. You, you ran into paradoxes that what we're finding out with this research team that's going on now, that you could easily perhaps begin to get an idea of how to overcome by, by investigations into life and, and human beings. And so, in that regard, the idea of the human credit system, the idea of mankind progressing forever, which is a funny thought, because there's two things. One is the idea of forever, in the way most people think about it, which is that you're, you know, before forever happened back here, and now the rest of forever is going to happen up here. And then there's an idea of the human being who is that non-sensual side of you, who looks down at that forever, that so-called number line. And you realize that this isn't a number line at all. You're just viewing what human beings perceive as a number line because we're human beings. And we can't escape what, what, we, what we mean as human beings is a difficult thing. Um, by that, I mean saying you're going to be a spirit that floats around and kind of views things from outside of time and space. Somewhat difficult, but in a certain <laughs> sense, in the realm of ideas, when you make a human discovery, where does that discovery take place? And where do these, these uh, things that we call innately human work, where do, they take, where do they take place? Where in time, where in space? The person who makes the discovery of anti-matter, anti-matter, once that discovery is made, that person made the transition from a, from a or at least when you, when you create the first matter, anti-matter rocket, that person themselves made the transition from a previous sense of space and time to another sense of space and time. So uniquely, a human being did that. Dinosaurs didn't do that, as we took up earlier. <clears throat> they didn't have the ability to do that. So what we're going to get into now, uh, in a little bit, is the kind of breakthrough research that's being had on these questions of, of, of mankind and science. Uh, one of the remarkable developments in science we've had in the recent period uh, is something that's right about 40 miles outside of the district I'm running in. It's at a place called Livermore, California. And you have the creation of uh, a, the first ever attempt to show um, proof of principle of, of a fusion reaction. And what they have is they have something called the National Ignition Facility. And we've gotten tours of this, we've been able to see this. It's literally a three a, a room that's three three football fields in length. It's got several laser beams. To be precise, you have 192 laser beams all heading into one little area um, <clears throat> with a little piece of, of fuel, which is a mix between deuterium and tritium, which are uh, well little little fuel pellets to to be used. And if you take your fingers, you just kind of do this with them, and you press your your fingers together, your thumb here, and your finger. If you press it, go ahead and do it. Just that. And you look at that little tiny thing you create, press them pretty hard. That little, that's about the size of the pellet that they use. 
So you have 192 laser beams that aren't even pointed to hit that. They're pointed to just go past it all at once in a, in a laser that takes place less than a, far less than a second of time. And to use the x-rays that are created by these lasers flying past this thing to create a compression that gets more energy out of it than you put into it. And so this would create fusion where you collapse this, this uh, deuterium tritium kind of thing that's put together in this little, as a fuel pellet. <clears throat> now, they are totally excited about this, extremely, extremely excited about this at this, at Lawrence Little International Labs. But most people don't even know, we had a bill passed and signed by Jimmy Carter, actually, of all people, uh, in 1980 to have a fully functional commercial fusion reactor by 2000, year 2000. Huh. And the name of this thing was the uh, Magnetic Fusion Engineering Act. And it was to fully fund this so we could have a, a fully functional commercial reactor 11 years ago. <coughs> 12 years ago. And it never got, and nothing ever happened to it. So there was a, we had the Fusion Energy Foundation, which a lot of the older members here are very, were involved with and familiar with. We fought to have this put in place. LaRouche led the charge to have a fusion bill passed. And then there was a great demoralization because under Carter and then going into Reagan, there was no funding for this. This thing never got funded the way it should have. It almost got funded under Reagan in during that process with the Strategic Defense Initiative, which, which Mr. LaRouche had uh, fought for, his policy. Um, but never happened. It's, it's still a bill as far as it's coming. As far as I know, it's still a bill that can still be put in place. It's not like it got voted out or something. I don't know how the bills work exactly. <coughs> but we now are poised with what's happening with Lawrence Livermore National Labs, what we know about the Van Allen radiation belt, what we know about what the moon is offering us in terms of being able to mine that, and two distinct proposals from Russia in the recent period. One is to make sure that we can survive things like earthquakes. Make sure we can survive things like asteroids hitting the Earth. Make sure we can survive all these things by using an array of satellite technology to be able to, to protect citizens of our planet from this kind of you know, uh, invasion of us by cosmic phenomena. And secondly, it was a proposal made two weeks ago to have a joint uh, U.S.-Russian base built on the moon. And this was just put forward. So they're ready to work with us. And I think Mr. LaRouche mentioned this. They want to work with us on a joint moon base, but it hasn't been allowed to happen <clears throat> because of Obama. So we have, and literally, we have the greatest future. I mean, this is, I think, the high point of what was just said here. We have the greatest future looking at us right now. And there's still the memory, even though Roosevelt's been dead for so long, the memory of what he did, and Kennedy, the memory of what these guys did is still lingering there, waiting to be accessed, waiting to be pushed, waiting to be put forward, uh, if we go ahead and move on this. Uh, a couple things I'm going to finish up here. One, what I found out recently at a meeting uh, at the NASA Ames Science Center was what would happen to the Earth if an asteroid hit it that was one kilometer in size in length. And the guy who spoke is a guy named John Chapman who's been in contact with us for some time. But if the Earth was hit, by a, meteor, by a meteor that's about one kilometer in length. This is what he said would happen. It would hit somewhere, somewhere. Immediately, we don't know where. Immediately within a hundred mile radius, you would feel, the first thing you would feel, you want to have an idea of what would hit you first when that asteroid hit? The sound, the sound. Actually, not the sound. Vibrations? Not vibrations. It would actually be heat. Yeah. You would feel heat. This, he said it would be 50 times the hottest day recorded on Earth that would hit you. You're gone. Let's say you hit under a rock and you're like, okay, put your head up. Then what would be the next thing that would hit you? Would be a gust of wind that was going 1,200 miles per hour. So let's say you blew away, but then you landed in like a pile of soft mud or something. Who knows? <laughs> you survive and you're like, alright, I made it. Then the next thing that would hit you would be a mass of debris flying at a incredibly high speed.
see that good night now. That would decimate everything for a hundred mile radius. <clears throat> now, to my knowledge, mankind doesn't even have anything that can do that kind of damage. Maybe several nuclear bombs, this one guy was talking about the atmosphere being destroyed, things like this. I don't know all the details of what a nuclear holocaust would be like, but an asteroid hitting the Earth that's only one kilometer in length <laughs> would be so catastrophic that for us not to go into space and overcome these things is a suicide pact that we've all made with each other. Yeah. Nice to know you all. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of that, if, if, we make, if we take the proposal that the Russians have put forward to us, we could stop that from happening. So I said, well, how many meteors, how many asteroids do we know have come near the Earth that you're talking about? And he said that we really only started monitoring asteroids since 1996, wow. near Earth asteroids. <coughs> that, and that since that happened, before that, we only monitored 50. Since 1996? Since 1996. This is our, we, we are an infant, like Jason was saying, with babies. So before that, we only monitored 50. When they started the conscious effort to monitor what happens, they recorded, anybody have any guesses? What they, what NASA? Since 1996. Since 1996. Uh, good guess. Good guess. Not true enough. In today's political climate, too, uh, such an event would be enough to trigger uh, a nuclear exchange, a thermonuclear exchange. Yeah, by that time, I don't think you'd even care. <laughs> you'd be trying to hold on to a rock with a green. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have to be that. It wouldn't have to be of that magnitude. It could only be a couple of megatons. It could be a much smaller body that would, that would you know, uh, touch off something much larger. Of course, we might not have to wait for that. Anybody have any ideas? How many asteroids? Four hundred? You said it's higher than two hundred, so four hundred? Higher? A thousand. Oh. One thousand. A thousand. Oh. 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 Oh.
in honor of 22nd District of, of uh, Texas. It's kind of like Keisha in this election. <clears throat> what he said in his first inaugural address, the first part of it was, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I thought that was phenomenal. At the end of that address, he's addressed the whole world. And he says, ask not what the United States can do for you, ask what we as a, as a human species can do for all humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of thing